Can these large language models actually do machine translation? And if so, how does it stack up compared to state-of-the-art machine translation supervised models? They don't just provide the audio dub, they also transform the lip and jaw movements of the person on screen to match the target text. And welcome everyone to another episode of Slater Pod. Hi, Anna. Hi, Florian. So joining us today for a brief news show is our senior research analyst, Anna Windham. So you're joining us today from Madrid, but last week you were somewhere else. Yes, I was in Malmo, Sweden for the NTIF conference. There you go, NTIF conference. So maybe just tell us a bit more about how, how was the mood over there uh, or up there, I guess, from uh, where we sit in the world, right? Zurich and, and Madrid. Uh, as usually, I, I would assume that the conference was brilliantly organized by Anne-Marie Coliander lint and Cecilia Enbeck, right? Yeah, absolutely. It was an excellent conference, uh, plenty of LSPs, leading language tech, lots of linguists from the Nordic and Baltic countries. And yeah, the mood going into, into 2023 was, I would say, focused and energized. <laughs> um, yeah, we covered a broad range of presentations from cybersecurity. IKEA talked about how they built their custom engine to translate into that familiar IKEA tone of voice. Um, and there was a great keynote by a leading Swedish journalist as well. So lots of insights uh, and expertise. Did they uh, build the kind of the whole thing from scratch or? Built it from scratch, built it internally. Um, and... Uh, yeah, built it, of course, using um, IKEA marketing materials in parallel texts and other types of materials as well. And uh, they went into some detail about how they had to kind of tweak the, uh, the input um, in order to capture that kind of informal IKEA voice uh, in all of the target languages. Yeah, we've been speaking about that in the past a little bit. Also, when we talk to investors, they always want to know, like, how hard is it to build some of these engines from scratch, right? And we're saying, well, it's it's not super easy, but it's also not, like, completely out of the realm of possibility. If you uh, dedicate some in-house tech resources, like, of course, a company like Gakia would have, I'm sure it's it's a doable thing. I mean, the question is just, do you want to do it? But apparently, uh, they wanted to do it. Sorry, just not to go too deep into that particular case study, but so was this more of a test or they're actually kind of using this in production now? They're using it in production. So they started off with a, you know, a small kind of iteration to see how it went. Um, but they've um, implemented it in, I can't remember how many languages, but a certain set of languages and they'll be expanding it um, to the full range of IKEA languages. All right. Well, so thanks a lot, NTIF, for having us there. Uh, that was uh, very kind and we'll be there again next year. Uh, usually it's around October or November, I recall. I think I was there in 2019, 2018. So today is a bit of a tech show. Uh, we'll be talking about Neural Garage, raising a seed round, Paper Cup, making headway with clients. Both of those are like in the broader AI machine dubbing space. Uh, briefly touch on large language models and how you can or cannot use them in machine translation, and then uh, ending on just a brief note on public sector uh, request for proposal RFPs for translation services. So <laughs> Neural Garage, what does Neural Garage do, Anna? So Neural Garage is a dubbing platform, um, and we've covered, it's kind of the latest in a series of um, Indian machine dubbing startups to have raised funds. Uh, the others that we've talked about and covered are DubDub and Dubverse. And while those platforms deal primarily with audio, Neural Garage focuses on visuals as well. Um, so if they're dubbing into a target language, they don't just provide the audio dub, they also transform the lip and jaw movements of the person on screen uh, to match the target text. Um, so their fundraising round, this was a seed round of 1.45 million um, led by Xfinity Ventures plus a number of uh, angel investors in India as well. It's kind of the same ballpark that we had with DubDub and Dubverse. Yeah, it seems to be a real theme coming out of India uh, at the moment. Um, so they, we spoke to um, the chief tech officer there, Sabrata Debna, and they said that their potential client base includes um, the kind of clients we've spoken about before. So streaming platforms, production studios, ad agencies, and especially I think EdTech is also one of the really the key uh, target segments uh, for this type of um, application. 
So the lip syncing, huh, is uh, is something that 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 they're already offering. Uh, very interesting. It's also a little. I mean, got to be honest here, a little creepy, right? I mean, if I had my video there speaking some some language I don't really understand, and then my lips or whatever that the image the 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 content would be lip synced, that that's that would be somewhat weird. And I mean, there's obviously a lot of deep fake going on, etc. So the, you can use this for both purposes, but of course in a in a massive, uh, you know, country, super multilingual like India, I mean, I do understand why there is a huge potential market and why investors would be looking at that, um, especially, you know, YouTube being super popular there. And of course, also all, all kinds of other uh, video formats and social media networks. Very interesting. Another company that we did have on the podcast about a year ago is Paper Cup. And they're a little um, further down the road now. They, we covered this week a a, a deal win. We, we do this sometimes when like there's a very interesting new client that uh, a provider would, would onboard. This one's interesting. So Papercup got Bloomberg as a client. And Papercup, again, is a, I think you could call it a AI agency for super highly automated um, dubbing. It's not. You can't really call it like AI dubbing per se or machine dubbing because they still have an expert in the loop for the translation component, right? So they do have synthetic voices, but they also have a platform where the translations of the content would actually be proofread and edited by uh, translators or editors that are in inside their kind of proprietary TMS doing this. So now they have Bloomberg, obviously kind of as high, what do you call it, as reputable as they get Bloomberg as a, as a media client. So if Bloomberg um, does uh, uses your system to provide content in, like I think it, for this one, it was mostly Spanish. So it involved Spanish content for Latin American and US audiences. Uh, they're doing 10 videos a day now, according to uh, Jesse Sheeman, the CEO of, of Paper Cup. So they, um, so basically you're, it, it's, you're watching a YouTube video. It is voiceovered uh, into uh, you know Spanish, and of course, there's there's other languages, and it's it's Bloomberg content. So it's very uh, it's very high reach, wide wide reach, wide audience content there. And Bloomberg, you know, has a, a reputation to uphold, so they wouldn't want to have any anything poorly translated out there on their YouTube channel, right? So that's why we actually did feature that deal. When I think it's a an interesting step in, ter in, in terms of mass adoption or just greater enterprise adoption of this type of uh, technology, right? Yeah, it's much more high profile. Much more high profile. Like it, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a creator like a YouTuber that like wants to get traction in different in different geographies. It's like a, it's one of the biggest names in global media using this using a synthetic voice provided by uh, Paper Cup, and then. Again, kind of that human in the loop, expert in the loop, um, translation into Spanish. And of course you can scale this into all kinds of other languages as well. Um, yeah, and so they, uh, uh, Jesse said they're turning around about 10 videos like this in less than 24 hours now. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, it's a super interesting, I, I really think it's a very interesting company uh, on, uh, in, in that media space. And you see that there's just greater adoption and greater acceptance of this type of technology for kind of mainstream media content. So. In terms of lip sync, though, interesting. We also asked about lip sync because uh, Jesse did mention it on the podcast that they're working on it. Now he said it's still something they have on the roadmap, but uh, it's actually what he says based on market demand, lip syncing seems to be quite low on the list. Very, very interesting. So you have this kind of simultaneous like voiceover that's very much in demand, but the lip syncing is a little less so, especially for content like, I mean, Bloomberg's news content. You couldn't have like Joe Biden lip synced into <laughs> into Chinese. That'd be that'd be quite odd. You <laughs> you want to make sure that you can still uh, you still understand that this is this is a, a, a translation and not the actual speaker doing this, right? Yeah, I think the lip syncing is more for I guess the media entertainment side and the content creation. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Actually, for anything news, you can't use lip sync because it would be, I mean, that would, I guess, would be fake. So, I mean, you, you'd, you're implying that that person speaks that language, which obviously they don't. Very interesting. I love this space. I think it's one of the most interesting uh, areas of the language industry generally as we, we're heading into, you know, 2023, 2024. There's so much going on also on, on just a 
the AI side with those large language models now, right? We did speak about Whisper on past podcasts, which was a um, uh, transcription, what do you call it? Feature coming out of um, OpenAI. And and now, uh, and, and so GPT-3 and all these, I guess, GPT-4 coming forward, going forward, these are so-called large language models. And I'll leave it to the many good YouTube tutorials to explain what a large language model exactly is. I'm going to butcher this anyway. Suffice it to say that uh, there's been a research paper by Google. Uh, when was this published, Anna? It was around mid-November. Quite recent, a few days ago. So there was a research paper by Google that looked at can large language models, in their case, um, in Google's case, something called Palm, which is similar to GPT-3 and a couple others, can these large language models actually do machine translation? And if so, how does it stack up compared to the what they call state-of-the-art machine translation, kind of supervised models, right? The, in, in a sense, the traditional neural machine translation model. I like how we're now calling it kind of the tra traditional way of doing neural machine translation. And um, one of the authors of the paper is Marcus Freitag. He tweeted, uh, so he's a staff research scientist at Google Translate. And he basically, I'm just giving away the conclusion here. He said that we find that although impressive, the sentence level translation capacity of large language models still significantly lacks that of competition grade state-of-the-art systems on, and then we have that usual uh, WMT test set, right? Now, people on this podcast might ask, well, what's the big deal? It seems like another kind of geeky, niche machine translation topic, but I feel it might be more than that because if machine translation is like an emergent feature of these large models that can do all kinds of other stuff, like, you know, text to image and text to video and transcription and all kinds of other applications, this might be bigger than we think going forward um, because, yeah, there's going to be another kind of, you, you can build all kinds of apps on top of these, these models. So if they kind of draw even in terms of performance with these more supervised models, we may see another kind of major shift in the underlying technology in machine translation. That said, though, I do want to have more experts on. We obviously had constant on from Tento. We asked him about it and we should bring on additional uh, experts uh, that can answer that question more definitively. Although, I mean, this is all happening super quick, right? So, I mean, again, this pa paper only came out, um, you know, a few days ago, so it wasn't even enough to speak to Constantine about. Cool. One final quick uh, topic I want to discuss here is the Belgian association or Bel two Belgian associations. Sorry, wh what did they call Anna? Can you help me there? Belgian Quality Translation Association and the Belgian Chamber of Translators and Interpreters. Yeah, CBDI, I, I was aware of them. Yeah, the other one, uh, Belgian Quality Translation Association. I love the name. Uh, it says, it does what it say, says on the tin, I guess, to borrow one of Esther's uh, expressions. So they released a um, best practices guide for public sector procurement of translation services. Very good job. I mean, they did a similar uh, paper in May 2024 in conference interpreting services. And now they did the same thing for translation. Now we don't have to go into the details. Anybody uh, feel free to go to uh, our website. And then, you know, we linked back, of course, to that, that guide. I think it's about a, let me see, uh, it's roughly 15 pages. What stood out to me is that they're recommending a 70% score, like a 70% weight of, to give quality of 70% weight in the vendor evaluation. Now, Anna, you've been in your pre-slater roles, you've been very much active on the kind of RFP side, quality side. Like, is this, this seems quite a heavy weight to be giving to quality. Yeah, it's a heavier weight than, than normal. Um, normally we'd see maybe um, other factors such as uh, cost and technological capabilities taking up a bigger proportion and moving quality down to 50% or lower. So, so yeah, they're definitely putting the emphasis on quality here in a kind of a new way. And also quality, of course, is always somewhat subjective, right? So it would be, um, actually this could be an interesting data piece to just look at how all the publicly available like RFPs, what's the overall weight given to, to quality? Um, 
Yeah, so a lot to discuss uh, also here in uh, our upcoming SlaterCon conference, which is going to happen on December 7th. So you still got two weeks to register, but, you know, we got a lot of great speakers, uh, probably going to hit again three, four hundred uh, participants. So uh, there's a lot of interest going into uh, into the new year on, on how things are going. A keynote be given by Brian Murphy, the new CEO of SmartLink. Then we have the WTO Head of uh, Language and Documentation Services, Blanca Pinero Canovas, speak about how they, uh, you know, run translation at massive scale at the WTO. Group discussion with Tarjama. And then Konstantin uh, Savinkov, who we had on the pod, he's going to uh, talk about machine translation, of course. That's his topic. And then we got a, a, the art of dubbing in a globalizing world. So the more, I guess, the entertainment side of dubbing, not so much machine dubbing uh, with, uh, you know, visual data, as, as Senior Vice President Simon Constable, uh, the DreamWorks VP Head of Dubbing, Scott McCarthy, uh, Chief Commercial Officer, Eve Group, Manel Carreras, and then Andrew. Andrew is going to do the dubbing moderation there. Uh, yeah, don't, uh, we have also a, a panel. How uh, you you're, you have a panel. Well, why don't you tell us a bit more about that panel? So we have a panel on adjacent services. So we're focusing here on areas where LSPs can expand outside the core of translation and localization services to find kind of new revenue streams or to kind of re reposition themselves in the market. And we're spotlighting um, two, two areas in particular. One is access services, and we'll be speaking with Verbit. And the other is linguistic validation, which is um, uh, part of the clinical translational life sciences space. And we're going to be speaking um, with RWS um, there just to get an insight into what are the barriers to entry uh, for these types of services and what kind of synergies and, and challenges LSPs might face uh, moving into these spaces. I, I love how, I'm not, I, I, okay, I'm, I'm hesitant to say random, but it's so different. Like you got kind of the access service on one side, you got the linguistic validation on the other side. Those are very different areas within the language industry. But yeah, the point here is to really highlight uh, the very different areas that LSPs can can work in, and we got a report coming up where we uh, spot like like fifteen of these. So stay tuned. I think it's another what week until we publish, or yep, should be out um, within the next week. Yay! And then telehealth and language access with UpHealth, um, um, Tatiana Gonzalez Gestari and Daniela Meter uh, from UpHealth, the U.S. healthcare uh, access service provider. And then we're close. So. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Again, next week, we do have a guest episode, so stay tuned and see you soon.